Join me, please, in our Palm Sunday call to worship. Sing songs of loudest praise. Sing songs that are unashamed. Sing songs without being afraid. Sing for the God of tomorrow and today. Let us worship the one who is worthy to be praised, and let us lift our voices. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. <laughs> who are here in the sanctuary and to those who are worshiping in other parts of the building. Good morning to those who are joining the live stream at the moment and those who will uh, participate in worship by tuning in later in the week. I mentioned this a few Sundays ago, but it appeared that the number we had in the sanctuary, I'll say, or in the building, I'll say about 100, uh, was matched almost one for one with uh, technology that was like tuned in to the live stream at the same time. So we need to get used to the idea, 2024, that uh, you can pretty much double the number of people who are here. That's how many are actually worshiping as part of the body of Christ at Knox Oakville. It's pretty exciting and new, and certainly things they don't teach you in seminary. Maybe they're teaching Rachel now, I don't know, but they did not teach us that back in the olden days. Uh, I'd like to express gratitude to Madeline and to Brian. What an incredible recital this morning. Thank you so much. And not to get ahead of ourselves, but there will be a recital next Sunday as well. I know we call them our Lenten recitals, and next Sunday is Easter. Uh, but we will still have a recital then as well. More on that in a minute. Uh, I got an update, 26 loaves, am I correct, of sandwiches that went to Evangel Hall, 26, well done, Knox, uh, so we'll do that again the third Thursday uh, of April, so well done, keep it up, see if we can break 30. Uh, after worship today, a couple of quick announcements. One, uh, it's your last chance, I believe, to uh, donate towards the flowers that the Chancel Guild uh, uses to decorate the, the front of the sanctuary. On Easter Sunday, those flowers are then delivered uh, to people who 
uh, maybe can't get out for various reasons. Uh, so make sure that you do that uh, today. I'm not sure if there's a grace period extended into the week or not. I don't want to put it on anyone. I'm looking. No, no, there's no grace. Sorry, we don't do that here. I'm just kidding. The point is you've had lots of time, so hopefully you're able to make arrangements if you haven't done so already uh, to make a donation uh, in memory, perhaps, of someone uh, important to you. So see them outside of the parlor at a table there. Uh, also, after worship, when you go down for coffee hour, because you have time uh, for coffee or tea, you can buy Grow Guide cookies from Emily. Hey, Em. Hey, Em. Happy birthday today. How old are you today? Seven. Thanks for bringing your Girl Guide cookies to share with us on your birthday. That's pretty exciting. So, yep, you can get a box of Girl Guide cookies if you like uh, and wish Emily a happy birthday. Uh, we are in Palm Sunday today, so we are at the head, the start of Holy Week. I did a You Are Here. Uh, so there are the services for the week coming up. Uh, I'll talk about Wednesday in a second. We have worship on Thursday night at 7 o'clock. That's the Monday Thursday service. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, sort of monologues, mid Jewish midrash and monologue stories around the people who interacted with Jesus throughout the events of Holy Week. We're going to kind of go Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday uh, and walk through those days together. And then uh, we have our worship at 10 o'clock Friday morning. Fellowship will happen ahead of time. Uh, we're going to have hot cross buns, compliments of the Chancel Guild as well, and coffee and tea will do that. I think it starts around uh, 9.30, is that right? 9.30. Uh, come on out for a time of fellowship and then worship. We're going to do a sort of Stations of the Cross, but I'm not going to ask you to move because this is a Presbyterian congregation. But that will be the vibe on Friday morning, just to let you know. That's right. Uh, so I do want to draw attention then to Wednesday. Wednesday would normally be Lent lunch and dinner church. Not so this week. We have a lunch and learn hosted by the land acknowledgement team. So bring your lunch and uh, come do some learning while you eat your lunch. Uh, it should be a good time. And I know that that team was gathered on Friday to plan for it. Easter is a week from today. Oh, I'm pretty sure it was just Christmas yesterday. So uh, I'd like to draw to your attention that we do two services on Easter morning. We do a sunrise, not S-U-N, because that's early, but a sunrise service at 8.30. Weather permitting, uh, we're going to do it out here. We always do it on the corner of sort of Lakeshore and Dunn. It's like 15, 20 minutes, uh, so we're not out there forever, um, but it's enough to stand outside and celebrate the resurrection. Uh, like I said, there'll be a recital then, an Easter recital, I guess, at 9.40 in here, uh, brass, and then worship at 10 o'clock. So some, a lot of people just do all three, uh, and you're welcome to do that. If you're going to do that, or you're going to do two out of three of those things, or even one out of three of those things, consider joining us for breakfast. Uh, so we do, uh, it's a habit that goes back, or a practice that goes back a number of years now, uh, a continental breakfast in the hall likely downstairs, uh, but it's potluck style, so if you could bring not enough to share with 200 people, but even, you know, a dozen muffins or a couple dozen croissants or some fruit or yogurt maybe, but let's keep the, the dishes to a minimum. Uh, finger foods are better. If we can just have a whole bunch of things downstairs for us to share together, that would be great. So if you're able to bring something to share, uh, please do so, and we will have breakfast in between the services downstairs. Uh, and Dinner Church will return on April 10th. So if you haven't been to Dinner Church yet, that's your chance. Uh, come on out and check us on April 10th. I'd like to just turn the focus back to outreach for a second, a reminder about groceries for your neighbor, uh, a partnership that we have with Kerr Street Mission, $20.00. Uh, provides fresh food to a family for a week. Our goal for March was $7,000 to provide fresh food to 350 families for a week. If you have not had a chance uh, to make your donation towards that cause, I would invite you to do so. You can make a check to Knox or use the, the QR code, whatever, 
just put in the memo line that it's for Kerr Street Mission or for groceries for our neighbor, uh, and we will make sure the funds get moved where they need to go. Uh, thank you also to those who have uh, given to the Adopt-A-Shelf program. Uh, it's going great. If you have brought things or you're looking to bring things and you don't know where to put them, go into Macmillan Hall, look to the right of the piano, and you'll see the bins there. So thank you. Uh, if you want more information about that, you want to talk to the cluster coach for outreach, which is Diana. Uh, I invite you to save the date for VBS, July 15th to 19th, and we're going to be host, uh, hosting VBS, not here because we'll be under construction, but at Hopedale Presbyterian Church. So more information on that soon. I just want it in your calendars. And finally, the flowers in the sanctuary today are placed in loving memory of Alec and Jean Kennedy by the Kennedy family. So thank you so much. Make sure you get a chance to take a closer look at those before you leave. That's it for announcements. I mean, there's probably a thousand more, but that's all you're getting. Uh, and we're going to turn to God in prayer, as has been our practice. I will start, uh, and then I'll invite you to join me in a prayer of confession. So let's bow our heads, take a deep breath, all the way down and out. God of grace and truth, we gather in humility and hope because we believe that you have the power to change the world, to change it for the better with your love. We gather because we believe no one is beyond your concern and no one is beyond your embrace. Such love astonishes us. Without your grace, we cannot even imagine such love. In this time of worship, inspire us with a vision of love and hope that will change the world and will change our lives for your sake and for your glory. Amen. The Gospel of John tells us that the crowds gathered to praise Jesus as he entered Jerusalem, singing and shouting with confidence. After describing the crowd, however, the Gospel writer zooms in on the disciples and tells us that while the crowds shouted praise at Jesus, the disciples were confused. The text says the disciples did not understand what was happening. A lot in our lives may look like this. Either we understand God's presence in our lives and want to shout it from the rooftops, or we're standing on the side of the parade, missing our chance to sing. That is why we need the prayer of confession. Because life happens fast and without a doubt, we have stood where the disciples have stood. So let's pray, because we don't want to miss our chance to sing. Let us come to God in our prayer of confession. Please join me. Holy God, we want to run into the streets and sing your praise. We want to be bold and unashamed of this good news gospel. However, too often, we find ourselves standing against the wall. Too often, we stay quiet. Too often, we let others carry the song. Forgive us for the moments when we could lead the parade, but instead find ourselves standing on the sidelines. Show us which songs are ours to sing. Show us which parades are ours to lead, and then give us the courage and conviction to do both. With hope and honesty, we pray. Amen. Church, no matter where we are on the parade route, whether you're standing, waving palm branches in the streets, or with your back against the wall, quiet and cautious, Jesus marched for you. Jesus' love, his striving for justice and mercy, it was for you. You are included in this story, and nothing can ever change that. 
So hear these words and trust them deep in your bones. We have reason to sing. For Jesus Christ loved you yesterday. Jesus Christ loves you today. And Jesus Christ will love you tomorrow. You are forgiven, claimed, and sent to serve. Go out and sing. Go out trusting in these words. Amen. It's beautiful. All right. I think kiddos are heading off with Connie uh, for church school. You need to do something with Palm Sunday or at least something about Jesus not being the kind of king we thought he was going to be. Brilliant. So if you'd like to head that way, you can follow Connie this way or you can just head down on your own time. Maybe you're already downstairs. I don't know. Uh, but uh, the lesson will be there. And we have Heather reading our scripture reading this morning. Good morning. Today's reading is from the Gospel of John, and it's the story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the colt. This story is told in all four Gospels, but the version in John is the shortest. The verses we're reading today follow the story of Jesus being at the home of Lazarus, where Mary anoints Jesus with expensive perfume. Meanwhile, crowds of Jews are gathering for Passover and to see Jesus and Lazarus. Enthusiasm for Jesus is growing amongst the Jews, while the chief priests are plotting to kill Jesus and Lazarus. As I was reading this passage, I had visions of the parade route, where people are lining the streets and cheering, and they're waving the palm branches. For the people of that time, the palm branches signified a symbol of joy and steadfastness, victory and triumph. I had visions of the parade organizers being the befuddled disciples, and they're just trying to stay with the game. I wondered what the people were thinking. I wondered what the disciples were thinking. And most of all, I wondered what Jesus was thinking as he looked out at the crowds. Let us pray the prayer of illumination. God of grace, your word is like a song. It is the melody that we long to sing. The refrain that we pray will get stuck in our heads. So, as we return to scripture once more, we pray that you would allow us to sink into this song. Allow us to hear the truth in between the words. Allow the cries of the crowd's hosannas to feel like our own. With open hearts and open ears, we pray. Amen. Today's reading is from John chapter 12 verses 12 to 16, and this can be found on page 875 in your Red Pew Bible. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's very funny to hear John had the shortest account of anything. He's a bit long-winded, that guy. So pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing, O Lord, in your sight. Amen. The crowds have been trying to make Jesus their king for a long while now. The crowds by the side of the lake started it all. When that crowd saw the sign that Jesus had done, the feeding of 5,000 people with just five loaves and two fish, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Word spread. 
as the crowd's enthusiasm for Jesus grew. They decided to crown him on the spot, and Jesus knew it. In John chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, it says, When Jesus realized what they were about to do, that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he took off. He withdrew again to the mountain by himself. He wanted no part of that. In our reading today, the crowd that has come up from the country to purify themselves for the Passover festival, well, they had the same idea. They wanted to make Jesus their king. Meanwhile, others had heard that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and they were sporting for a fight. The chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who knew where Jesus was should let them know so that they might arrest him. I know that we've been in Matthew's gospel for the past three or four weeks, but if we had been in John's gospel, we would have had the heads up that the chief priests and the Pharisees were on the hunt. Why? Because Jesus is drawing crowds. The problem with drawing crowds is that it consequently draws the attention and suspicion of Rome. And the last time the Romans squashed a Jewish revolt, in the time of the Maccabees, less than two centuries before, well, it did not end well for the Jews. The chief priests and Pharisees do not want a repeat situation, so best to keep our heads down and not raise any more alarm bells with Rome, knowing full well that the empire strikes back. Okay, fine. That was really funny. That was a Star Wars joke, and nobody laughed. I'm going to... Whatever... I thought you were with me. It's rude. I invite you all to go watch that later, and you will see that that was an excellent line. It's terrible. I don't even know what I'm doing up here anymore. Jesus wasn't the only one they wanted dead, though. If you were here for Lent lunch this past Wednesday, you'll have heard the story that precedes our reading from today. Heather made reference to it brilliantly. Uh, that of Jesus resurrecting his friend, Lazarus. News of that miracle spread quickly and became the final straw for the religious leaders. So Laz, who was enjoying a second shot at life, unfortunately, found himself also on their hit list. The Pharisees and chief priests needed to eliminate the living evidence of the sign that Jesus performed. So the word is out that the religious authorities are looking for Jesus. His whole brand is drawing attention, and that puts them at risk of bringing the fury of the empire, the Pax Romana, down on their heads. They have painted him public enemy number one. For Jesus to show up in Jerusalem, especially during all the heightened tensions and busyness of Passover, would be a direct in-your-face challenge to their authority. So listen again to the words from the reading. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, the hot goss. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. The crowd arms themselves with palm branches, arms themselves. That's a bit overblown, preacher. Not really. We just don't realize their political significance. Palm branches serve as a symbol of resistance to foreign rule. Hmm. In an article by Jay Hart entitled Judea and Rome, the official commentary, he states, from time of Maccabees, from the time of the Maccabean revolt, palms or palm branches had been a national symbol. Palm branches figured in the procession which celebrated the rededication of the temple in 164 BC. And again, when the winning of full political independence was celebrated under Simon in 141 BC. Later, palms appeared as a national symbol on the coins struck by the Judean insurgents during the first and second revolt against Rome. We don't catch this because 2,000 years later, in a world apart, we've domesticated Jesus and his message. We've made Palm Sunday cute. 
We've given palms to children and invited them to do parades. We've taken the teeth out of it. Not you and I personally, and certainly not intentionally, but we have inherited this milk toast rendition. So let me put this bite back into the scene. Where we see this, where's my first slide? We have a slide. Yes, where we see this, the original audience saw this. Go back again. Where we see this, the original audience saw this. Changes things, doesn't it? The crowd arms themselves with palm branches, a symbol of resistance to empirical rule. Add to this that the crowd around Jesus are singing his praises with an adaptation of Psalm 118. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The crowd wants to make Jesus their anticipated national political messiah. For Jesus to enter Jerusalem amidst shouts of political affirmation and waving palm branches, it was all seen as an act of defiance against Roman rule. Perhaps the only thing that tempers the defiance is that Jesus rides in on a donkey and not a warrior's horse. I read one commentary this week about uh, the power of being on a donkey, and particularly a colt. That would have put Jesus at eye level with his followers and with the crowds, unlike a war horse, which would have put him up above and looking down. Even here, Jesus chooses to be at eye level with the people. With the benefit of hindsight, we can understand that Jesus on a donkey rather than a war horse points to the truth that God's plan of deliverance would not come by military might and violence, but would come through humility and love. Hope, humility, and love operating in an environment of danger shows us what God can accomplish and how. So let me pause here. While the parade into Jerusalem is documented, as Heather said, in all four of the Gospels, twice the number of occurrences than the Christmas story, what sets John's account apart is perspective. And that's important for our Lenten journey this year with our wandering hearts and our fickle faith and our focus on the disciple Peter. Instead of presenting the parade story from the perspective of the disciples or even of Jesus himself, the author of John's gospel is singularly focused on what the crowd is doing and saying. In fact, even though all attention is on him, Jesus doesn't speak a word in our reading today. Did you notice? John invites us to imagine ourselves among the crowd. Are we enthusiastically singing praise? Are we joining in mm, a little hesitantly? Or are we outright standing back? Are we convinced of our convictions or are we confused by the cacophony? And where's Peter? It's like those Where's Waldo books. Remember the I loved those. Where's Peter? The Palm Sunday story leaves us imagining where Peter might be and how he is participating. I don't have an answer for you. Just some wondering questions. I wonder if he was starting to get cold feet. Or I wonder if he was swept up in the crowd's energy. All we know is that the disciples did not understand these things. Curious, that. Like you'd think that the people closest to Jesus would really know the plan, right? Like the members of Danny Ocean's Eleven. You'd assume they'd have heard and mapped it out over weeks putting the plan to memory rehearsing before even opening the front door. You'd presume the disciples would be aligned with Jesus and with each other and the plan. 
But on that day, as Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey, to the cheers of crowds and the waving of palms of resistance, the disciples were dumbfounded, confused, and unclear. It's sometimes like that, isn't it? Name a single revolution in history when all parties were entirely aligned and of singular vision and mind. You can't. History has shown this time and time again. Whether it was a civil rights movement, or the right for women to vote, or the American or French revolutions, or, 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 I could keep listing them. Even if there was general agreement about the goal of liberation, the methods of achieving such were not unified. Neither was the appetite for risk. I wonder, have you ever attended a rally, or a march, or a protest? I have, lots of times, on main intersections in the city, and bridges at Queen's Park, and even at the White House. That was a trip. There's a protest or a rally or a march, whatever you want to call it, this Friday at 3 p.m. at the Clock Tower downtown here, hosted by the Oakville Gaza Peace Group, calling for a ceasefire in Palestine. Maybe I'll see you there. Most times that I've attended these kinds of events, most times it's been totally peaceful. Other times I've faced some resistance, even some harassment. Seldom, but not never, have I experienced threat. If you haven't attended a march or a rally, let me tell you that while the original organizers might have a plan in mind, crowds have a mind of their own, as do individuals within that crowd. In fact, Usually when I show up to a protest or march, I rarely even meet the actual organizers. I've looked it up, I've learned the details, and I head out. I just make friends with the people around me, and we commit to solidarity. So I can imagine what it might have been like to be in the crowd at the Palm Parade. I can imagine the passion and the enthusiasm. I can imagine that some were there in simple joy and celebration, while others were there looking to tear down the empire with violence, if necessary, and everything in between. I can imagine that everyone had their own idea about what it all meant and what to expect the outcome to be. I can tell you no one expected it to be Jesus on a cross but I don't want to give away the plot. I can also imagine the disciples, the ones closest to Jesus, growing nervous about the crowd. Crowds are hard to control. They have a mind of their own. Maybe it was all just getting out of hand. The empire expected them to be praising Caesar, but instead they're shouting for the one entering the city on a donkey. And they're waving Palms of resistance. Their singing is subversive, it is courageous, and it's contagious. Their praise shows the ripple effect of public displays of faith. I get it. I get it. But here's the other thing about parades, and rallies, and protests, and marches. While they are powerful demonstrations, powerful public demonstrations of solidarity and strength, they are only one act out of many in a movement. In fact, most of the work of resistance happens long before a march and lasts well past it. The Palm Parade itself isn't what raised the ire of the religious and political elites. It was everything that Jesus and his chums had been doing for months and years. Talking about this kingdom of God, calming storms, breaking bread, even with outcasts, healing and feeding and visiting and touching and exercising demons. 
The work of resistance starts long before the parade. It starts in our hearts and it starts in our homes. Then it organizes in small groups and then in a community. Like a single snowflake that joins with other ones until it forms a snowball which when coming down a mountain, picking up speed and more snow becomes an avalanche. And while palm branches of resistance were raised around Jesus in his entry to Jerusalem, I would argue that songs of loudest praise had been whispered and sung for a long time before that by women in their kitchens and men around fire pits and children playing in the alley. You might never feel called to attend a march or protest or a rally, and that's okay. That's not the sum total of discipleship. It starts in our values and our relationships and how we prioritize community and the well-being of others. It's in how we allocate resources and finances and energy. Songs of loudest praise against a world of deadly politics, environmental disregard, racism, sexism, and ableism. These songs of resistance aren't just shouted at parades and rallies. They're in our homes too, and our meetings, and our gatherings. Let me tell you about a little act of resistance that we're starting to participate in here at Knox Oakville. Maybe you've already started to hear whispers of it. But let me give you some background. All around us are statistics and stories of churches declining and even closing. Here in the presbytery of Brampton, half of our congregations stand empty in the pulpit. And very few of them can afford to call a minister, even at half time. Many of them are well below 50 members, most below 20. The situation was grim even before the pandemic, but the last four years have sped up the decline. Clergy who didn't opt for retirement burned out. The landscape of organized religion here in the West seemed doomed. The only ones seeming to be white-knuckling it were the hyper-conservative, fundamentalist, or Christo-nationalists. I won't sugarcoat it. The statistics for us mainliners are alarming, even disheartening. And yet, in the middle of it, Knox Oakville has been presented with an opportunity to resist this cultural trend of decline and death in the church. Hopedale Presbyterian Church, over on Third Line, is one of the churches who is without minister, and the few members left there are exhausted but convinced in heart and mind that God isn't finished using them yet as an outpost of the kingdom. So what then? They sent us a letter back in November asking, would you consider amalgamating with us? We have since sent a team over a number of times and we've invited a team here from there to prayerfully have discussions about what it might look like to become one congregation, strong and faithful, with two campuses. When all around us churches are closing, not just Presbyterian, the Lutherans, the Anglicans, even some of the Catholics, United, declining, going into survival mode, palliative, and closure. In the midst of that, Knox Oakville has been presented an opportunity to resist that narrative 
and to choose life and to be creative about it and hopeful to sing songs of loudest praise into a world that would like to see organized religion done and dusted. Hosanna. Hallelujah. The ink is certainly not dry on it. We are just in the early stages of conversation and prayer. But I would invite you to pray for this opportunity for one congregation with two campuses, downtown and in Bronte. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the possibilities for life and growth and ministry and outreach? Hmm. Not everything is a rally. There's a time and a place for palms of resistance, but songs of loudest praise begin in our hearts and our homes and our meetings, and our congregations, and our priorities. Pray for the courage. Pray for the courage for our congregation and theirs to see God's vision of one strong congregation across two campuses and what that might mean. Our closing prayer or poem for this Sunday is called Courage. And so let's have courage, Knox. It says, we summon every ounce of courage. We give ourselves pep talks and we call our friends. We dig deep within. We practice the words out loud, rolling them around in our mouths, imagining the response. We deal out every what if card our brain holds on to and spend absurd amounts of time imagining all the ways that it could go wrong. And then finally, blessedly, we say it. I love you. To speak the truth of your heart takes courage. It always has, but please summon your courage. Join the parade and speak with conviction. For God has been saying to the world since day one, I love you. And so, what is your response? To God be all the glory. Amen.
church is worshiping today. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. God of our lives, six weeks ago we gathered in this place to begin our Lenten journey. We reflected on our mortality, on our need for each other, on our need for you. It has not always been an easy journey. We have been stretched and challenged, as we will continue to be in the week to come. We are grateful, God, that we have not been alone on this journey. We're grateful that you've been with us all the while, supporting us even as you confront us and invite us to be transformed. And we are grateful that we have had each other as traveling companions. You have created us to be in community with each other. And on days like this, we know why. Thank you for this sacred community, cast in your image, shaped by your love. Thank you for its open doors and open hearts. Thank you for the way it stands, not in a closed circle, but in a horseshoe where there's always room for more chairs to be pulled up. Help us as we follow Jesus together to always broaden our concept of community to include not only those we know and love, but also strangers near and far. And yes, even our enemies and those who profess to hate us. You have shown us, God, what is right and just. You have shown us what it means to love as you love. In Christ, you have shown us what it means to live lives of radical obedience, radical humility, and radical love. In Jesus Christ, O oh God, you came to us in humility, reaching out to all with mercy and compassion, and then you ask us to do the same. In gratitude for all the mercy and compassion we have known, we pray for those who find themselves in humble circumstances. Hear us as we pray for the unhoused in our communities and for refugees wherever they take shelter. For all who find themselves without enough resources to cope when necessary things are so costly. For those who live in isolated communities and lack the access, care, and technology that so many of us just take for granted. Embrace them, O oh God, in your mercy. And humble us. Lest we put too much trust in our lifestyles as a source of life's goodness. Hear us as we pray for all those who have been humbled by unexpected circumstances. For those who face illness or injury. For those who know death or disaster, fear or failure. for victims of crime and those who suffer through the misjudgment or mistake of others. And we pray for those who suffer because of the consequences of their own actions and choices. Embrace them, O oh God, in your mercy and humble us, lest we imagine we can live our lives untouched by trouble. 
Lord, may we live our lives with such determination and focus that we might find the courage to lay aside the pleasures, comforts, and needs of our own lives in order to give life to others, indeed abundant life for all. God, you call us to be a part of your kingdom. You call us to lead others to it. So hear us now as we sing for the coming of that kingdom in the words that Jesus taught us so long ago. about the Hopedale thing. Uh, first of all, I'd like to point out those who were on the team that went and spoke to Hopedale on behalf of the session of Knox Oakville. These are people you can talk to about what has happened so far, what conversations have happened so far. So um, if I call your name, can you stand, please, if you're in the room? David, Warren, Jane, that's the choir folk. Oh, and Phil is in the choir. Connie, who went downstairs with the kids. And Joe, who's up in the balcony. You can talk to any of these people. Thank you, you can sit down now. Uh, just to hear about the conversations that have already happened. They do not know what the plan is. They have an idea about the conversations. God is going to invite us to discover the plan as we move forward with Hopedale. Just like the disciples, right? Once this gets out into a crowd, which we just did, it's hard to control it. So we trust the Holy Spirit. I know that the congregation at Hopedale are aware of the conversations, and they're thrilled. But they don't know the plan yet either. We have to trust the Holy Spirit. Starting this week, more groups are going to start talking between Hopedale and Knox. Finance people and outreach people, more members of session and administration and calendars. When this place closes down, in part for construction with new roads, we're going to move some of our stuff over to Hopedale and have some of our groups participate in ministry there and invite our people to lead ministry from there. We're going to see what happens. And we're going to be open to the chaos and the joy of God's Spirit. And we'll see where the Lord directs us. But don't go looking to any of us to have the plan for you. The plan is prayer and listening and openness and curiosity and creativity. And we'll see where it goes. So I invite you to have conversations with those I've mentioned or each other and pray, and pray, and pray. An amalgamation would be a sign of resistance against a culture of death and decline. Let us sing songs of loudest praise. The call for the offering. The season of Lent leads us closer and closer to the cross. 
As we contemplate Jesus lifted up for our sakes, consider what the gift of his mercy and grace means for you. Let your offering express your thanksgiving for such an amazing gift from God. Whether you give through preauthorized remittance or through the QR code uh, or through the plates that are about to come by, uh, your offering to God is a representation of your gratitude and your loyalty and your hope and your trust and your faith. The offering will now be received. Enjoy. Lord Jesus, you gave so much without counting the cost. Bless these gifts with your generous love. Multiply them. Use them to bless the world with the same hope and healing that we have found in you. And let us not count the cost until we too have given all that we can for your sake. In the strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Hopefully you will take the opportunity to stick around for a time of fellowship. Our Coffee Hour hosts today are Carl and Pam Nelson. Thank you very much, uh, Carl and Pam. Also remember, you can get some Girl Guide cookies. Emily, the birthday girl, will be down there. You're uh, welcome to avail yourself of that. 
Um, I just want to speak uh, for a moment about the Holy Week services. If this is your first Holy Week experience with Knox, uh, or maybe your second or third and you don't, let me just give you a heads up. I'm going to issue a benediction at the end of the service today, and I will not issue another one until Easter Sunday. So today, at the opening of Holy Week, uh, we open our worship together, and we will not fully close it again after today until Easter. And so if you're here for the Thursday night service, we will depart in quiet. If you're here for the Friday morning service, again, we will depart in quiet. I like to create the feeling that the story isn't over yet. And so Knox, welcome to Holy Week. Our closing praise number 217 in the Navy hymnal, if you choose to use it, ride on, ride on in majesty. of faith. We believe in Jesus of Nazareth, who rode through the streets of Jerusalem on a donkey. We believe in Jesus of Nazareth, who challenged Rome's oppressive power with peaceful protest. We believe in Jesus of Nazareth, who was surrounded by crowds of dreamers and believers. We believe in Jesus of Nazareth, so even today, we will sing songs of loudest praise. Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And now we lay down the palm branches, and with them we lay down our belief that there is any other way for you to be God. As the last echo of the final alleluia fades, so does our hope that this journey can end in any other way, Lord. The week stretches ahead, glory-less and painful. Whether we walk 
with all faith or none, we look now towards the cross, knowing it is both the most human and most divine of all journeys. And so we travel the road only by your grace, with courage, with love, and with the uneasy peace that is the gift of faith into this holiest of weeks. In the name of creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Thank you.